Okay. Well, we're going back to Genesis. We took a little break last week to... I think I'm a little hot. I feel like I'm a little hot. Ron. Um, yeah. Yeah, hot, loud. Sorry, I meant my... The mic is... That's a term when the mic is hot. It's like loud, yeah. Um, there we go. Yeah, I feel like I was... If I was going to raise my voice, I was going to blast you guys out of here. So, <laughs> so yeah, we took a break last week in our study of the book of Genesis um, cause because of, you know, what's happening in the Middle East right now. We wanted to answer some questions about Armageddon and, you know, how we can understand from a p- context of Bible prophecy you know, what, if anything, what's happening in the Middle East is, is significant. And it always is significant. I mean, everything, every time there's a war, every time there's a geopolitical um, conflict, you know, it, it, everything is moving in a certain direction. I mean, we, we are toward the end of our, our time here and on Earth's history. And, and we're told that the final movements will be rapid ones, so we, we should always be paying attention to what's happening in the world. But at the same time, um, you know, we also have to keep things in context and perspective because, um, you know, there's, there's going to be two great movements, religious movements happening parallel to one another in the last days. One's going to be a true religious movement, and that's going to be centered around keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And and the other is going to be a false m- movement that is based on unity through compromise of God's truth. And uh, and so we, we should expect at some point the world to come together. But right now the world is not coming together. Right now the world is what? Fighting against each other, right? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. So we're still in that pre-stage before we get to the final events of Earth's history. Um, and unfortunately, we, you know, we, we live in this world where there's lots of hate, lots of... Um, oppression and and just unfortunately a lot of pain and suffering so uh, I definitely recommend you you know always stay up to date with what's happening but don't don't ride the waves of emotion you know with with (laughs) people are always trying to get you to pick a side on, on these things even with in our own country like you know, you, you got to pick a side. You got to be a Democrat. You got to be a Republican. No, you don't. You don't have to pick a side. <laughs> uh, you, you don't have to. You, sometimes the choice is to, to say, look, um, you know, we're, Christianity is not supposed to be political. I mean, that's just the reality. Jesus was not political. Jesus uh, was focused on one thing and one thing only which was sharing the good news of salvation, helping people, healing people, writing misconceptions about God, and ultimately forming a movement that was countercultural to the political and empire uh, movements of of his day, and and that applies to us today too. So the, the best thing we can do is to not let politics drive our emotions. We need to let people drive our emotions. We should care about people. We should care about those who are suffering. We should care about those who who are deceived and don't understand the truth. And one of the big deceptions in the world today is actually evolution, right? Evolution. So we're going to be talking about that today. Um, Actually, remember, we're kind of following the the outline of patriarchs and prophets. So we're we're doing the chapter on the literal week, if you want to follow along in that book. Um, but we're going to be talking about theistic evolution, 
and a little bit about evolution and then we're going to compare why those theories are um, problematic and uh, and I'm sure there's other things we'll get into along in, in that discussion so let's bow our heads for a word of prayer Lord we thank you so much for the opportunity we have today to to open the word of God Lord we pray that you will lead and guide us in all of, uh, of, our, of our reading, our understanding, and application of the Word of God into our lives today. Uh, we pray that the discussion today will help us better appreciate the Word of God, and Lord, that our trust in you will grow. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, the... Uh, the idea of a literal seven-day creation week is one of those ideas that is ridiculed a lot by the world at large. So much so that even within Christianity, there is a large section of Christians who, you know, believe in this long-form creation, or we call it theistic evolution, where God created the earth over a period of thousands or millions of years, and, and some people who claim to be Christians but want to buy into evolution at the same time will claim that each day in the creation week, you know, stands for an indefinite period of time when God, um, you know, through evolution accomplished what was described for that day. So, um, this is prevalent, right? I mean, anywhere you go that is, has a, you know, like a museum or a park or a textbook, for the most part, is going to tell you that the earth is billions of years old, that the, um, you know, that humans... Um, came along, uh, you know, I think 10, 20,000 years ago, but, you know, the most of, you know, for instance, we get into dinosaurs, of course, they're saying those are 30 million years ago, 60 million years ago. Um, it goes on and on. So, so we're, we're, we've kind of become so accustomed to it, sometimes we don't really think about the implication of that worldview and and so we're going to talk about that today and then I, I definitely want to to hear your guys's perspective on this as well um, but when we go back to the book of Genesis chapter 1 uh, we find a clear pattern of the biblical record concerning creation right so so let's start in verse 3, and let's read to verse 5. Someone could read Genesis 1, verses 3 to 5. I'll read New King, Jam New King James Version. Verse okay. 3, Genesis 1, verse 3. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Okay, so what are some patterns that you see here in that, those few verses? Of course, it's repeated for each day. So, you know, the first day God created light. The second day God divided the waters, the firmament in the sky and the waters on the earth, and the oceans. Then the third day God created all the plants and trees and everything that exists on land. And then on the fourth day, of course, God created the sun, moon, and the stars, right? And the fifth day God made the fish and the birds. The sixth day God created the animals and human beings. And, of course, he rested on the seventh day. So each day you can read in Genesis is describe what God does, 
and then it's and then it repeats the idea that the evening and the morning were the first, second, third, fourth, fifth day. So so what are some things from the text that we can learn about about whether or not we should view this as literal or figurative? Because a lot of some people will say this is just an allegory. So what from the text what are some clues from the text that we should take this story literally? If we're Christians, obviously I'm not expecting unbelievers to accept creation, right? But we're, the concern to me is more with Christians accepting evolution than non-Christians. We should expect non-Christians to reject uh, creation, even though I still think evolution is nonsensical, but uh, at least macro evolution. But uh, whatever, they, they don't believe in God, so that's that's the only option they have. But for Christians, this is, this is problematic if we begin to, to view this as, as non-literal. So what are, what are something from the text there in those three verses that would help you um, indicate that, that this should be something taken literally? So I would say um, the evening and the morning was the first day. Like. Yeah, he marked off the, the start and the finish, the evening and the morning. So, I think God knows what he's doing. Yeah. Did you want do you want to say something, Mike? Yeah, I'd like to say um where do we get the uh our week from, our 7-day week from? Because we have a 24-hour period which indicates a day because the sun because the sun comes up and the sun goes down, we got 24 hours for that. Then we have the lunar cycle, which is 30 days or so or thereabouts. But what is basis for our 7-day week? There's only one answer. Yeah. That is the seventh day of creation. Amen. Amen. Great. Love, love all these different points. So we got point one is the, the evening and the morning, um, you know, indicating the, you know, that, that can only happen in a, in a literal day. We have your argument for, for the idea of a week, which, like you said, every... Every day is the, is the amount of time the, the earth rotates. That also includes the year, because the, the, we go around the sun in one year. Right, so the earth days. spins around in 24 hours. But there's no basis for an actual week or seven Correct, days. there's, no, there's no, no basis in, in astronomy okay. for, the, for the week, exactly. Um, yeah, and, and that it's... Comes it, from, that comes from Genesis, mm-hmm. has to. Yeah, and even human language kind of interesting that, um, you know, you find in many, many different languages, this, the word for the seventh day is Sabbath in different languages. Um, so I think it's something like 40 or 60 different languages that, that have Sabbath as, as, the, as the, the name for, their, for the seventh day. So, yeah, okay, so great, great points. Uh, any, any, anyone else have, have a thought from, from that? Yeah. Is it turned on? There you go. Okay. I just think that if we're reading the Bible and we're saying that this is God's word, and it says here, so the evening and the morning were the first day. It doesn't say the first year, the first thousand years, the first million years. It says the first day. And so we're supposed to take him by his word. And that's, he clearly states it was the first day. Amen. I love it. Yeah. So there, there are multitude of, of problems, theological problems that you run into when you, when you decide or believe that, that this is an allegory or this is an indefinite period of time. Um, the, the main one is, and this is something we talked about, I think, at the beginning of this series, was the power of the Word of God, right? So when God says something, does it happen? or not right and, and and so this is intimately connected with salvation and I will say this the, your understanding of creation is intimately connected with salvation because God 
spoke and created something out of nothing, right? Notice now 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse six and seven. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Hmm. So here we have Paul quoting Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 and but he's not talking about creation. What is he talking about? Salvation, right? And, and yet he's saying just as God spoke light into existence at creation. Were you going to say something, Mark? Oh, I sure do. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, if he says it, then it's possible, right? So when he says we have salvation, do we have it or not? We have it. We have it right now. It's ours. We just have to grab a hold of it and believe it. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Well, it, it's true. I mean, think about, first, for instance, think about Psalm 51, one of, the, one of our favorite, everybody's, one of everyone's favorite psalms as far as a beautiful picture of, of repentance and, and God's grace, right? Uh, but notice verse 10. Someone can read Psalm 51 and verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So what's the first word there? Create. Yeah. So creation is intimately connected with salvation. Okay? That, that is something I want you guys to, it's a theme for tonight, is, is creation is intimately connected with salvation. Now, this is true when it comes to the Sabbath as well, right? Sabbath is intimately connected with creation and salvation, right? So let's look how that is the case. Let's go to the fourth commandment. Let's go to uh, Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And let's read verse 8 through 11. Someone can read that. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do, shall not do any work. Thou nor, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy main servant, nor thy maidservant, nor the cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that's in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Alright. So, right in that commandment, what happens to that commandment if we don't believe that Lord created the earth in six days and rest on the seventh. What what does it do to that commandment? Well, you can't rest because you don't believe in the first six. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's no Sabbath. There's no Sabbath. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know, Kim, were you going to say something too? It abolishes it. It, uh, why does it okay why does it about I, I agree with you why does it why does it abolish the sabbath commandment the fourth commandment if we don't believe in a literal um one week creation well because he says here um that in six days um we should do all our labor and we should rest on the seventh day so if we don't believe in a literal day one day creation 
then there is really no need for this. This is literally makes no sense. Yeah, I mean, so it, it destroys, I mean, 100%, it destroys the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment is based on a literal understanding of the creation week. And like mentioned before, we have, why do we, Mike said it, why do we even have the week to begin with? You know, there, there is no reason for the week to exist Amen. unless it was established uh, for humanity, right? And this, uh, the week is not just a Western concept. The week is universal human uh, concept. Why is that? Why is every culture around the world keep and, and, and recognize a week? You know, if it's Jewish, if it's only from the Hebrew Bible, you know, no, obviously we know because the Bible tells us that all humanity, um, you know, split, you know, we'll be getting into that next time, the Tower of Babel, right? But, but before the Tower of Babel, we were all one people in one place. And, um, and so we, we, we split around the world, but we, that week had already been established um, and, and people took that with them wherever they went. So, so number one, yes, it, 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 takes away, it abolishes this, the Sabbath, and it, it destroys this meaning because the Sabbath commandment is based on the idea that we work six days like God did, and we rest on the seventh day like God did, right? And, and so, so we see there, and, and, and then of course, here we see the, the fourth commandment is telling us why we are to rest, right? Because, because God created the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. He's our creator, right? So we, we worship God on the seventh day because he is our creator. But remember we said <coughs> creation is intimately connected with what? Salvation. Salvation. So let's look at another version of the fourth commandment in the book of Deuteronomy. There's actually two some people don't realize there's just two, um, t- two, two lists of the, co- of the Ten Commandments in the Bible. One's in Exodus and the other's in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And, uh, but the, the, the fourth commandment is worded differently in Deuteronomy than it is in Exodus. And I'm not sure why we um, always just quote the fourth commandment from Exodus. Why we don't use this one? They're both in the Bible. They should be uh, both relevant. But anyway, that's a, that's a side point. De- Deuteronomy chapter 5, 12 through 15, if someone could read that. I got it. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is, it, who is within your gate, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. How far do you want me to go? Fifteen. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. All right. So now in this version of the, of the fourth commandment, we have a different reason for keeping it. In the first version, it's because God created the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. In this version of the fourth commandment, we're told to keep it because why? We were slaves and now we are free. Yes. And isn't that the description of salvation? Amen. We were free slaves again. to sin, and now we're what? Free. Set free in Christ Jesus. Amen. So, so again, we see salvation is intimately connected with creation. Creation is intimately connected with salvation. They, they, the reason God can save us is because he is our creator. It requires an act of creation to change our wicked hearts into a heart that is in tune with God. And what gives God permission to change our hearts is because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Jesus paid the price to, to, uh, to cover our sins, and because of that, then God can, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can come inside of us and change us 
and make us new like him. So, so we can see right away that ch- d- messing with the literal understanding of the creation week um, messes with the whole foundation of the Bible. Now, there's another problem with theistic, creation, theistic evolution as well. Because theistic evolution requires, uh, the, requires death to have existed before sin. Why is that? Um, if you study the, um, the uh, geologic columns, or well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a scientist, I'm not exactly sure how, but they have these uh, you know, diagrams in books where they supposedly on different levels represents different ages in the Earth's history. They are called columns. Is it, is it columns? Yeah, that's what I, I think that's what I said. Geological columns. Yeah. And so, but what do they find? They find fossils on each what? Each level, right? And, and according to theistic evolution, when did humans come along? Higher, way higher up on the, on the geological column, right? Well, the Bible says that sin didn't exist before Adam and Eve sinned, right? And that the wages of sin is what? Death. But what happens if there's death existing before sin? That's problematic, right? It's very problematic. Because essentially then, w- sin didn't cause death if you, if you, if you, if you accept theistic evolution. Death existed before sin. And, and so then we're, we're getting at the root of, of the, the heart of, of the great controversy too here because we know that what is the definition of sin? The, the, the breaking of what? The law, right? So, and the wages of sin is death because we broke the law, but if death existed before sin then sin has no um, influence on, 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 our, on our existence at all, right? And, and therefore, keeping the law then makes no difference as well. Um, because, you know, that, that, that undermines the, the law is the definition of righteousness, and breaking the law is the definition of sin. So you were going to say something, Mike. I was going to say, then we don't need Jesus then either, if, because there's no, there's no sin, there's no, there's no breaking of the law, so we don't need Jesus. So that's why all that stuff that they're teaching really ruins everything. Yeah, the whole thing falls apart once you, once you start taking the Word of God as not something to, that is living and powerful. I mean, it, that, that's, what, like, that's why one of my favorite passages in Hebrews, and I know m- many of you are familiar with the Hebrews chapter 4, this is the basis for Christian faith, right? Is belief that the Word of God has power, right? And, and without that, then Christianity is, is literally only a philosophy. It, but it, it isn't, it's not transformative, it's not salvific, it, it doesn't... Um, it's just a guide for living your life, but it's just in the same level as any other uh, self-help. Exactly. So Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, if someone could read that. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discern discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the word of God is living and powerful. I think that's the point that I want to emphasize here. What does that mean to you? What does it mean to you? And why is that important when we're talking about this topic of of creation? But beyond that, why is it important to believe that the word of God is living? Think about that. Living and what? Powerful. Powerful. So what does it mean to you that the Word of God is alive and powerful? What does that tell you about the Word of God? And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Well, you could talk about that too. <laughs> <laughs> I was focusing on those first two points. Yeah, but yeah. Well, living and powerful. I mean, he, what, what God says 
happens. And uh, so it's living. And then it's powerful because whatever he says happens right then and there. Well, I don't know. Well, I think if, if we are listening to the Holy Spirit within us and we obey, then we will be following God. But if we decide not to do that, then we will be going the other direction. So I think that the spirit within us is always help trying to woo us and make us to follow God. Yeah. I mean, the word of God is alive. That means the words in this book are not just words, right? What makes these words alive? What makes this book different than another book? It's dynamic, right? So, so the word of God is able to adapt to your needs, Amen. right? It is, it is perfectly designed to meet exactly what you're going through right now because it's alive. It's not dead. So the God can take these words because they're not dead. They're dynamic. They're not literal Words that the Bible wasn't given to us from uh, a uh, it wasn't dictated. It was it was the the prophet who wrote was inspired, and 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 God inspired his thoughts, and he wrote the thoughts that God gave him right in in his own words. But but that but the human language it doesn't doesn't restrict the word from 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 being more than what is just on this page. It, you've had that happen to you before. You can read something and God takes that word and, and teaches you something beyond that, that you didn't even realize. And that's why every time you read the Bible, you can learn something new about God because it's a living book. And again, going back to the power part of it, right? It's, it, it actually has the power to create, Right? And, and it has creative power. We don't, but the Word of God does. And that's what, that's what faith is. Now, if you go back to Hebrews chapter 11, um, and we talked a little bit about this one day, but Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, if someone could read that. Well, actually, 1 through 3. Go ahead, 1 to 3. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were, were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So the very first thing, according to the Bible that we need to believe by faith before anything else is that God, what? Created. The things that we see were created by things that we cannot see. We can't see God, but he created everything that we see today. So that requires faith. Faith in what? We, we believe the word of God, right? Is that a blind faith? No, because the word of God gives us evidence that it is not just the words of men. Why? Because it's living and powerful. And there we go to the double-edged sword thing. What do you think the double-edged sword refers to, Mark? You, you brought that up. But what, what, why is the word of God a double-edged sword? Well, I was thinking of the emotional, the physical. In my life, what it did to me, I was one way, and then the word of God changed me. You know, it changed my heart. And so it, it came out. It says this, well, the two-edged sword cuts you to the right to the bone, right to the marrow. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you, you see yourself and you see the things that you've done that are really wicked in your life and that you want to change. Yeah. And yeah. He, he changes us. Even, yeah. even if we don't want to change, it still cuts us. Notice um, Acts, chapter, Acts chapter 9, I no, maybe it's 8. No, maybe it's seven. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, seven. Um, 
verse 54 50 to 57. Acts chapter 7, 54. Now this is after Stephen was at the end of his testimony, but notice, right before he got stoned. Acts, Acts chapter 7, 54 to 57. I've got the uh, amplified. Oh, this is a hard one. Now upon hearing these things, they, the Jews, were cut out of the, uh, cut to the heart and infuriated, and they ground their teeth against Stephen. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, and controlled by him, gazed into heaven and saw the glory, the splendor and majesty of God, and Jesus standing at God's right hand. And he said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at God's right hand. But they raised a great shout and put their hands over their ears and rushed together upon him. Wow. Okay. So listen to this. The word of God is living, powerful, and sharper than two-edged sword. Even to the unbelievers. Paul, Stephen is preaching the word. They don't want to hear it, but it, what does it say? The Bible says it cut them what? It cut them to the heart. And, and, and so in order to stop hearing it, they literally put their, their fingers in their ears. Can you believe that? And yet they still killed him. Even under conviction, they killed him. Um, so, you know, that's why we should always pray for our enemies because they're never not under conviction. Even, even if they don't admit it, they're under conviction. And uh, God doesn't give up on people. Um, but nevertheless, th you know, it doesn't mean they don't, there's just consequences for, for resisting the Holy Spirit. It's called the unpardonable sin. And when you start calling the spirit of God the devil that's the unpardonable sin because once you start believing that the spirit of God is, is, is the devil then there's nothing God can do for you anymore you've, you've, you've called light darkness and darkness light and uh, you know there there are people who have who unfortunately have gone down that path um, but you know, going back to our, our topic on theistic evolution, um, you know, there, there is, unfortunately, a lot of Christians who struggle and feel embarrassed by our belief in the, in the, in the literal weak creation. They feel like it's anti-intellectual to believe that. Uh, <laughs> They, they think we're all brainwashed and stupid for believing this. So what do you say? How, what have you said? I, I'm sure someone here before has gotten in a conversation with someone about the literal week of creation. Um, what, what are some things that, that you've heard? Is there anyone has any questions about maybe something someone has said that you didn't really know how to respond to. Um, how many of you have gotten into creation evolution conversations before? Because it doesn't just have to be theistic. I mean, it could be a non-believer who just believes in evolution. I mean, I guess technically there might be Christians who actually believe in evolution, even though I don't know how they could do that, because then how could you be a Christian um, if the world created itself, in essence? So, yeah, just wanted to to open that up for, for anyone that, that has a, a question or a thought about that. Well, one of the things that, uh, we say, carbon dating. And I said, well, who, who invented the carbon dating? And then you're dating something that's already there, and you don't know how that got there. I said, it's just a circular argument to me. Yeah, well, I'm not going to be able to yeah, answer the scientific questions because I'm not a scientist, but... Uh, I, I do know that there, you know, the idea that things took as long as they said is, uh, has been proven to be false when, when um, it, it's, it's not consistent. You know, there, there's, a, there's a flood 
And of course, that's related to the flood as well. You know, if you, if you believe in a, a worldwide flood, then the flood explains a lot of the geological um, you know, arguments that people make to, to justify their belief in evolution. So it's a combination of, of believing in a literal week and a flood. And, and if we trust what God says, everything makes sense. Uh, you, you know, any one of us who, who've, who've traveled around the world, I mean, you've seen the evidence of water in the desert so many times. How many times have we been to the desert and you can see that at one time that was clearly covered in water? There's clear evidence. Um, and, and science doesn't necessarily disagree with that, but they disagree with the idea that it was a flood, you know, and they'll say that it, they'll have all kinds of, it happened over millions of years, right? Yeah, Phil. I've had conversations with evolutionists who are um, quite well versed on it, and they don't realize that much of what they, of the logic of what they believe is based on manufactured and false information. science, mm -hmm. false information. So at the end of the conversation, it always comes down to a matter of faith. That's right. A hundred percent. It takes faith. Since none of us were there at creation, even the Bible says it. Even Adam and Eve, let's think about it. Were they there to see God create everything? No. They came to life, but they didn't see God make any of it. They had to believe that as well. They had to believe that, that um, by faith, because they didn't see it. Um, but the cool thing is, in the new earth, we all get to watch God create it all again. Amen. Right? Uh, because if you go to um, the book of Revelation... Verses 1 through Revelation 21, 1 through 5. Revelation chapter 21, 1 through 5. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle, tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Amen. I love that. So, you know, we, the angels got to watch God create the earth in six days. But we'll all get to watch God do it for the new heavens and the new earth. And <laughs> I'm imagining he's going to do it just like he did it before, one day at a time. Uh, and, and we get to celebrate that, that first Sabbath on the new earth with God in the New Jerusalem. Um, one, can you imagine that worship service, right? After seeing God recreate everything, yeah. and then the holy city comes down, and we, uh, we go out of the city, and we walk, and we walk in the new, brand new earth on that first Sabbath. Wow. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? <laughs> So anyway, um, 
Any other thoughts? I don't, I don't have anything else. Yeah. I just wanted to comment on Mark's uh, observation about the two-edged sword. Because a knife can be used for good or for evil. And that two-edged sword set me free from the bondage of sin. Amen. It cut the bonds and the uh, chains that, and ropes that bound me. And that, but that same two-edged sword will condemn and bring ultimately death to those who don't accept the freedom that's offered. Yeah, because I didn't read the, so I should have done both. So Acts chapter 7 talks about them being cut to the heart and putting their fingers in the ears and rushing and killing Stephen. Acts chapter 2 describes 3,000 people hearing the preaching of Peter being cut to the heart, same word, except they said, what must we do to be saved? Amen. <laughs> and Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you. Amen. And you will receive salvation. Yeah. Amen. And so that is the response. The word of God is, is living because it pricks our hearts talks to us and it's dynamic and uh and it's it never grows old and that's why it's something that we should read every day right we need to read the god word of god because it is living and powerful and when the word of god is in us guess what we become living and powerful beings because the word of god is in us not because of us but because the word is in us <laughs> And, uh, and then we become, like, like Paul says, we become light shining out of darkness in a, in a world that is, is very dark, and they need light, and they need the Word of God living, incarnated in us. And uh, that's, that's, what Christian, that's what Christianity is supposed to be, it's the, the Word living in flesh, human flesh, um, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So... Uh, all right, well, let's, Alpha the Omega, that's right, the beginning and the end, amen. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this study. Thank you for the opportunity to examine the foolishness of human reasoning, trying to apply falsely, science falsely called to the, to the Word of God. Or may we use the Word of God to to be our lens to interpret the world and not use the world to interpret the Bible, Lord, because we know that we will always misunderstand and be confused and be ultimately deceived if we go by human reasoning to, to determine the validity of the Word of God, Lord. But I pray as we read the Bible with faith, Lord, that you will make the words come alive like you've promised, and Lord, that we will be convicted, not just from the truth in the Bible, but the power of that comes into our lives as we read it, and we sense your spirit, we sense your presence, Lord, and we know that you are with us, and you will never leave us or forsake us. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, good to see you guys.